I'll, we'll open up the waiting room. All right. Okay, hi everybody. Just taking a second. I see people connecting to audios. So officially, I will say bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde on behalf of all of us behind the scenes here at Fourth Space. Welcome to Welcome to, I feel like I'm stuttering because I want to say welcome to, to feel good, you must feel bad, to too. Uh, we are joined by Ariella Friedman and Sarah Mangel as they enter into conversation about making art, making community and creativity as an act of resilience. We are so happy to welcome you in person. Thank you both for being here with us. And those of you, of course, joining us online to Concordia University's For Space, whereby we work to connect people to the initiatives, research projects and dialogues happening across the university via live events such as today's. We are recording this session and we are live streaming this event and I'll pop those links into the chat momentarily. We do invite you to join in the conversation today when appropriate to do so with a raised hand or via the chat. It is a meeting so you know the rules but that's it for me for now. I'll pass it over to Ariella. Welcome in. Um, welcome to the third event of the Health Humanities and the Arts Working Group. Thank you all so much for coming. Today, we're going to be talking with Sarah Mangle about the COVID-19 art project. Sarah Mangle is an artist, an educator, and a researcher based in Montreal. She currently studies the scientific, performative, and cultural dimensions of psychological measurement and the history of questionnaires used to study LGBTQIA2S people at Concordia University. On March 13th, the first day of COVID lockdown and the day a state of emergency was declared in Montreal, Sarah started writing and audio recording all ages art prompts. These art prompts were mailed out to over 350 people daily for 152 days straight. And then a weekly following that for over a year. Some of you here I know were part of that project, which was just this extraordinary durational participatory artwork aimed at encouraging creativity and combating isolation, creating community and facilitating catharsis. Sarah is going to take us through the two years of that project. She's prepared an incredible slideshow so we can see some of the images that were collectively created and then we're going to talk together and open up for your thoughts and questions. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. I'm really excited to see this. I'm very grateful and overwhelmed. Thank you so much. So I thought what I would start with, because I really want to somehow bring us collectively back as much as we can to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I thought one way to do that might be to just read a couple of the first art prompts. So uh, I, before the pandemic, I was an early childhood educator. I've been a child, early childhood educator for about 15 years. And uh, one of the parents, when the first lockdown happened, one of the parents uh, emailed me and said, you know, because at that time, if we can remember, all the schools and daycares were closed. And so parents were working from home and also child caring from home. And so one of the parents said, would you please teach us some art like they were just like how do we fill our days like what you know sort of a stunned state of like okay and so i was like i don't have the capacity to to teach i don't even know like i was like that's beyond the scope of what my brain can do right now but let me email out an idea and then i just kept going and the people who became interested became more intergenerational as the project went on so at the beginning unfortunately i don't have the first one but i have the fourth so on the fourth day this was the exercise hi there i hope you're doing good today's exercise is called drawing bad art materials crayons colored pencils or pencils no erasers. Today, I want you to make the things that you find 
Today, I do not want you to make things that you find beautiful or smart. Today, I want you to do the opposite. I want you to get out a mirror and make faces at yourself while you draw. Be bad. Scrunch up your face while you draw and see what happens to your drawings. Stick out your feet and see what happens to your drawings. Stick out your tongue at yourself. Make some other faces. You yourself decide what they are. Be bad. Break a few crayons. Draw with broken pieces. Tear up a drawing if you want to. Draw some terrible, very bad faces. Draw some terrible hands that don't look like hands. Draw some muddy, disgusting poop and pee. Come up with your own terrible things to draw. The more, the better. Nothing is off limits. Draw with the hand that you don't normally draw with. Send me photos of your terrible, very bad drawings. I promise to love them all, but make sure you make them very terrible. And then on uh, art exercise day five, this exercise became the one I think of the most actually when I think back to this project. Slow art, what can you see out your window? Get set up with some paint, paper, at least five pieces of paper, water, sponges, and a pencil, maybe some thick markers, whatever you love to make art with, at a table and a chair, so that you can comfortably see out the window. Ideally, you are very close to the window so you can mostly see what's outside. For example, push a table right up to the window, or sit on your bed and look directly out your window. Better if you can touch the window pane from where you are. Set a timer for one minute or longer if you feel comfortable. Before you start making art, sit for one minute or the amount of time you've set on the timer and just look outside. Maybe for one minute, maybe one minute will feel too long. Another way to do this is to hang out at the, at the window with a family member and talk about what you can see out the window. Maybe you live by yourself. You could try speaking out loud what you see out the window. Watch what happens to your window. We've been inside a lot. Think about this, this is day five. So it's like, really, we haven't. But anyway, uh, look for things outside that surprise you. Notice things that you see that make you feel happy. Notice the things that make you feel relaxed to look at. After the minute, you, if you want to sit and watch some more, watch for as long as you like. And then slowly make some marks on the page. You do not have to make drawings or paintings or things that you see. The idea is to hold with you what's outside your window inside of you, in your chest. Imagine this, let it outside come in and see what you make. Be surprised by the things that you make. Don't decide what to draw before you draw it. Let yourself sit by the window and make marks for as long as you like. Take breaks and leave the art materials by the window. See if you feel like coming back and doing some more. Maybe try it out another window. And then we'll just do one more at day 16. So this project went for 152 days straight. So it evolved, but I wanted to just start us at the beginning um, to just sort of see where we were at. So here's the last one. This is also one of my favorite ones. This is day 16, make a mess. The other day I was texting with a dear friend who was really feeling worried about school. She's studying a very hard subject and her school is continuing even though we're all in isolation and it's very hard to focus and do a good job. I think for a lot of us, even though we're in a completely new and challenging situation, we still look for self-worth and life purpose and productivity and we tie our self-worth into doing an excellent, impressive job. For a lot of us, the idea of making even a small mistake makes us feel like we have made an epic failure and that this failure is tied to whether or not we should deserve a seat at the table of life. Now, this is an extreme thing to say, but I also know that, that from a feelings place, this is true for many people. I know right now a lot of parents are wondering if they are good enough parents, if they are spending this time with their children in the right kind of way. Perhaps one way we can be good to ourselves during this time is to be more forgiving of mistakes and be softer with ourselves and one another. In order to be more forgiving of mistakes, we need to make some mistakes. That's where this activity comes in. I want you to make a big mess and not only do I want you not to feel bad about it, I want you to see if you can enjoy it. There are so many ways to make a mess. For this assignment, I want you to make a mess, and for a little while, do not clean it up. In the same way that our repair cafe exercise, which was another one, from a few days earlier was a performance art gesture that hopefully contributed to a collective repairs in the broader world, my dream is for this epic fail make a mess situation to help us all be bad and let go to release and relax, to laugh. Here are some suggestions for messes you can make. Number one, 
get out a cup and some juice and pour juice all over the counter, miss the cup, wait at least 15 minutes before cleaning it up. Number two, paint with just your hands. Number three, go outside and jump in some puddles, squish mud in your hands, make sure you get water and mud on your clothes. Number four, bring mud into your house and make a mud painting. Make sure to get some mud on the table. Five, eat spaghetti and sauce with no utensils. Six, put on some lipstick but entirely miss your mouth. Now apply some bad eyeliner. No gender restrictions on this one. Number seven, squish oatmeal in your hands and rub your hands through your hair. Number eight, walk through your kitchen with muddy shoes. Number nine, dump your dirty laundry down your hallway. Number 10, destroy a t-shirt, draw on it with markers and cut weird holes in it, put it on in its terrible state and take a photo. Now these are just a handful of ideas. There are so many ways to make a terrible mess. Notice how you feel when you make the mess. How easy is it for you to let yourself do it? How quickly do you wanna clean it up? See if you can let the mess be for a little longer than comfortable. See if you can make the mess a little messier. Great things can come from your messes even when it doesn't seem that way. I will be so happy if you send me photos of your messes. Please enjoy these photos of yesterday's noticing walk activities. Sending love, Sarah. So the next thing uh, I can think to do is just to you know share, basically what I've prepared is one image per day of the, uh, of the experience. So I'll just slowly go through. And you know, there are a lot of people here today who participated, so it will be fun also for people to see their work.
And that's, that's the, that's our time together. Like that's the, that's the period of time. Yeah, so I guess, you know, the project really became sort of layers of interaction because I was, I was keeping a list of activities to do and then I was writing one every morning and I was recording it, but then people throughout the day were sending me emails of images and experiences and I was sharing those the next day. So it, it became this way for us to like witness for ourselves what was going on and also witness each other in any way and build a kind of different kind of feeling of a different kind of community. And so the, the, the art making for me, like the art, the artiness of it for me, the, the most important part was the interaction, you know, like, like for me, it's like art for art's sake when art is the interaction, you know, and what we're doing together is is sort of loose and suggestive and exploratory and uh, everybody is invited, you know, that's the kind of the thing. Yeah. So I hope I, I hope I explained it well, but you'll ask me some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. It's very cool to see all those images. I felt a little bit like I wanted a soundtrack, like it was like a bar mitzvah slideshow or something <laughs> like that. And we needed some, some sort of music in the background. And then I thought, oh, it's sort of interesting to listen to it. Or to, to have silence. Well, yeah, to listen to, listen to it to silently. It. I think yeah. I was, yeah, kind yeah. of mixing my metaphors there to watch it in silence and to enter into a kind of a, a meditative space while going through it. I was thinking about those um, prompts that you read out and how much work must have gone into those prompts. Like they are so thoughtful and so developed. And the voice is a voice that I actually very much associate. Uh, with you, but also reminds me of some other artists. It was mm -hmm. a real lead generous uh, labor of love, I think. So you were telling me a little bit about the very beginning, how yeah. some parents reached out to you and said, help. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, okay, here is something I can do. You know, I'm wondering about the moment when you decided to do it this way and how long you thought it might go on and um, maybe what gave you the stamina to keep it going, especially daily, which must have been pretty extraordinary. Yeah, like I decided that I would do it for as long as the pandemic was going, thinking at that time, you know, people were saying two weeks. So like I thought, you know, I was like, so I was very, 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 very anxious at the beginning of the pandemic, like on a somatic level, very anxious. And uh, as a result, like I had a lot of anxious energy. And so I actually was waking up super early in the morning, going for a walk around Jerry Park and blasting dance music and like trying to dance, you know, and people were jogging and there was like this sort of exchange. But I had energy to, I had energy to expel this way. like. I wanted to do something and I didn't think about it too much initially. Like I, it felt, it, 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 uh, it felt easy to do, you know, like it felt like uh, writing a letter every day, like that was, that was to other people, but also like, wasn't really a journal, but it didn't feel like, it felt like live journal, you know, uh -huh. of another time. Um, and I just, there wasn't a lot to think about during that time other than to worry. So I had the day to think about other activities. You know, I have about 50 more I could do, you know? So it was it was a joyful thing for me to do and feel connected. You know, it, it, it itself gave me energy. So it didn't feel like, oh, do I have the energy for this? It was like, it's the morning I wake up, I have something I'm doing, this is what it is. You know? This is what I'm doing during the pandemic. Exactly. It was like, okay, yeah. it's the pandemic. It's this is what I'm doing. Here yeah. is my exercise. Yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. Um, did you have artists who inspired you in the prompts? I know we both love Linda Barry, and I can feel oh, a little yeah. bit of Linda Barry in this. I'm wondering if there were um, other places that you took your ideas, or if you were drawing on your experience as an educator, or if you were just coming up with things. Yeah, um, on like, your own? like, 
definitely like had this ed educator energy that needed somewhere to go. But also I was noticing as I'm looking through like uh, Elise Gravel, who's a local uh, yeah. book like illustrator and writer. I, I initially like she was also doing art things kind of publicly. She was doing like free coloring pages and stuff. And I shared some of those and uh, I had a Mo Willems like drawing prompt. I think there were a lot of artists who were doing like interactive things, especially at the beginning. So definitely, but yeah, like I was, I was grabbing inspiration from all over the place, you know, like I, I was, I, it didn't need to be just from me in any way, you know, I was just sort of like, oh, maybe we could do this, you know, maybe today we'll all order pizza, you know, it's sort of like a variety, a variety bag, you know, in an email. I was thinking of how the prompts that you read out they direct people towards different things which seemed really important during the pandemic being yeah. comfortable with ugly feelings um, being willing to express yourself uh, paying attention and connecting to the natural world yes. uh, being willing to live with the mess that was made of the thing that you thought was your life yeah. without having the power to resolve it that prompt is so stressful for me actually even when you read it out not that i'm necessarily such a tidy person but the idea You're like, of no. <laughs> having the yeah having the ability to do that and uh and sit with it it's like a version therapy practically yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems it's in like some let's ways exposure let's go yeah really challenging yeah so i wonder you know as you were writing these how much were you thinking okay I want this to have certain kinds of um, health effects for my audience. I want to give them these kinds of healing. I know that they need uh, this kind of release. Yeah, like I think I was, I was trying to listen in a particular way that is kind of hard to describe, but I was trying to listen to what was happening and then try to speak to it mm -hmm. in some way. And I was trying to, like I wanted people to feel like they could talk about what was going on for them and they could have space to in a little way sit with it a little bit you know but yeah I was trying to do a kind of listening around to kind of like what what's being expressed in these small things can I name them sometimes you know can I try to summarize some of what's happening okay so yeah. you were being a sort of a channel through yeah. being attentive to your experience of the pandemic to what you were picking up yeah in conversation with your audience slowing down and trying to say okay what is this need that i am feeling or what is this impulse can i name it and can i translate it into an action which is a little bit more concrete yeah and like like in a sort of performance art way can we represent it somehow mm -hmm. in a gesture that's like metaphoric and you know it is interacting with our emotional worlds like can we you know like can we make our faces look terrible and draw it and stare at ourselves can we like get some of that uh, agitation out somehow because it's let's face it it's here anyway kind mm -hmm. of kind of thing yeah and how soon did the feedback loop become part of the exercise and immediately immediately so that was there from the very first yeah. uh, communication that you yeah sent people out? just sent me photos of what they had done Before and i didn't i don't think the first time i said send me photos i just i think people just said Hey, okay. here we did it, you know? Okay, so it started off as something that was unprompted. Yeah. And then it was something that you built into the exercise. Yeah, and I think people liked, like I noticed I used the word assignment. Like I think people liked the idea of it being homework. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, because... I'm like sort of playing teacher, you know, it's like the fantasy of my childhood realized, you know, I get to suggest activities to people and they're doing them, you know. It was like very fun. And also I think people, you know, some people were really isolated. So the fact that they could report back to me 
Uh -huh. Like also people would say, I'm so sorry, I haven't done any of the activities, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not grading you, you know, like I don't have a clipboard. I'm not like, you know, but people like, I think people are used to feeling a sort of obligation to something. And so I think it felt meaningful even to say, I didn't do it, you know, for to, to show up and be seen and, uh, and, uh, be accounted for in a certain way because i think some people felt like i submit my work for the day and i did something you know right. it's productive yeah some structure of exactly and i say good job thanks so much and i share the work you know so it because you know it's like i contributed something and right yeah and it's all real i mean it's like performance and it's like art based but it was real too you know so it's what do you mean it was real like i'm saying i'm sort of reproducing a sort of school feeling or a sort of work feeling but it was also its own real exchange you know it's mm -hmm. it's like replacing certain things we're used to but it was also existing in its own real uh, so you, thing. you you started it on facebook am i am i right is that no, where it was did it always begin? on email it was always on email okay yeah and then your list grew yeah people so, started sending them to other people mm -hmm. and then other people started joining and then it just grew so was it surprising to you when it became intergenerational and at what point did that shift yeah well i am like a very i'm very much like make work for all ages at all times you know like uh made a couple of coloring books that were like very explicitly not adult coloring books but they came out right at the beginning of the adult coloring book craze so there was like nothing i could do about it you know mm -hmm. uh people were like you made an adult coloring book i'm like it's for you and other people you know yeah. it's for everybody um and so but i noticed at the beginning that i was i was sort of relating to the children in the group at the beginning uh, i'm using the language of kids like when i'm talking about the art makers i think it was probably two weeks or something that i tried to um really expand because i also wanted to have adult conversations because i'm an adult and so there was moments where i think i was writing more to the adults uh receiving them than the children and the other thing is that it, it became more and more apparent that like children while they're dealing with isolation which is quite difficult children were quite adaptable especially at the beginning they got to spend all this time with their parents you know but parents and other adults were really struggling with like the implications and the day to day a lot more. So I wanted them to really feel like they were really invited, you know, to participate. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about that idea of the all ages artwork, and I'm thinking about the idea of an all ages project during the pandemic. Yeah, because one of the things that the pandemic really did do is it increased the isolation of different age groups from each other, yeah. especially the isolation of the elderly people, but yeah. also to some extent, little kids who were in these, you know, bubbles and who weren't having the kind of interactions with other adults who weren't part of their family that they yeah. normally would have. Some of them still are not because uh, they're yeah. still being cautious or they're too young to be vaccinated. It's really interesting also to hear you talk about how kids surprisingly were sort of okay but there were forms of isolation and ages at which that isolation felt particularly extreme it seems like there were all kinds of um, perverse effects i remember uh, talking to a, a friend of mine who you know who's a therapist and him saying yeah for lots of parents the big fight is getting out the door in the morning to school mm. and not having that stress just hugely changes the energy of the day. So yeah. I love the idea that this returned a little intergenerational interaction to a period in which people were set apart in so many different ways and divided in so many different ways. Yeah, like there's some of the images you see at the beginning of the slideshow where there's just kids lying on their stomach looking outside in the window. You know, they're just spending kind of expansive periods of time with each other and outside. And uh, I think especially at the beginning, that was probably quite generative mm. in those situations. And then as time goes on, I think probably, because the other thing is that things changed so much. You know, kids eventually did go back to school and I was, I continued, and people went back to work. And so the beginning of it, 
uh, as horrible as it was externally in the, in, uh, in the COVID situation, like feeling that mostly things had stopped was so generative for art making, you know, like you have this time and what are you going to do with it, you know? So that actually is quite interesting. I think of that as the time of the pause yeah. at the very beginning when yeah. things were suspended in all kinds of different ways and when time and space suddenly worked very differently than we were accustomed to and we were very aware of uh, the, the passing time and the particular sticky nature of pandemic time. And I do remember at the beginning, all of these artists suddenly showing up and participating almost in a, a gift economy. Yeah. So all of these for-profit opportunities had shut down and all of um, the things that kept people busy, not all of them, some people, you know, another thing about pandemic time is that it's very uneven. So, you know, healthcare workers were, you know, working all the time frenetically and, um, you know, people who did deliveries or, you know, people who worked in essential services, they were, busier than ever and then all of these other people were were stalled um so i remember you know how it felt kind of magical at the very beginning when people were allowing you a sort of intimate access to their worlds and they were uh, famous or incredibly talented and you were watching the living room of I don't know the indigo girls or something every like that day. at the, every at the day. very beginning before you were used to it and people and before you were sick of zoom and people had these like very low tech setups and they made all of these like silly beginner mistakes and they were um, vulnerable in a way that uh, one wasn't accustomed to seeing because they weren't produced <laughs> and yeah. they didn't have a whole operation around them. I'm wondering, partly I'm wondering about like what was generative and what was beautiful about that early impulse, but I'm also actually wondering about why it petered out. Cause I think of that as being the first two months. Yeah. And then it seemed like a lot of those things just either they fell off the radar or people weren't interested in them or people realized this is going to last for a long time I, I can't participate in a gift economy like i need to figure out some way to to re-monetize my practice or, or something else it felt like for a little while the rules were different and it felt good and then all of a sudden um, those things that shifted again um, did you did you participate in some of those um, acts of artistic generosity Do, does that resonate with you the idea that it was this brief moment of a gift economy where all of these people thought like i want to share something i want to i want to give something yeah like i can remember that i could if i wanted to live stream from morning to night different people offering different things and one thing i was noticing was librarians were reading kids books basically all day like these different libraries I was live streaming different natural settings in these different bubbles on my computer all the time. Puppies who had just been born, an eagle's nest. I would watch sunsets and sunrises at different times. And yeah, people, concerts, like, like you could attend five concerts at the same time. Yeah, of, of people of various uh, fame statuses or whatever, you know, yeah, we were all in their living rooms, you know, yeah. For me, like, I think this was this art project was like my like generous like regular uh, offering, but I loved that, and I I also like you, as you're describing this, Ariella, it made me want to try to track the phrase back to normal. Like, when did it show up, and what happened with the discourse? You know, because now people will say in different capacities we need to get back to normal or we have to you know we can't be and that sort of feels like what's connected to me to like this the great pause you know where like people reimagining different things or lots of people shifting their job situations like there was really and lots of people moving to the country you know like big life decisions in this period of yeah like two months were made, you know, mm -hmm. um, and 
we were aware of being disoriented and we got kind of used to it and then we could make choices kind of easier you know this is kind of amazing other kind of space but yeah i loved that different economy it felt like there's still a few things in my neighborhood of park x that exist there's many free meals on regularly there's a mutual aid group that delivers things to people it feels like there's um some very visible uh differences that have come from the pandemic that are incredibly beautiful that i'm i'm not directly a part of but i i'm a fan of yeah yeah i guess i wonder it's not over yet the pandemic it's too early to talk about something that is post pandemic we're yeah. sitting here with our with our masks on yeah. and um wave number six, six but who's counting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know what does that even mean at this point point? and yeah. i think that's one of the things that uh, we're reckoning with because that idea of back to normal means something very different for different people yeah I i'm wondering for you personally what doing this artwork changed uh, about your relationship to art about your relationship to other people do you think of it uh, a little bit as part of the pandemic bubble or has it shifted things in your understanding of how you want to be in the world and how you want to make art in the um the after times <laughs> and i guess i'm also the thinking after time. if there are after times yeah <laughs> and i guess i'm also thinking in general like what it what is going to carry over what forms of revelation uh what long tales of decisions um, what kinds of consequences, what kinds of questions, what kinds of habits, what kinds of practices? It's a great question. The first, the first answer I have is a very small but uh, beautiful thing. Uh, one of my very active art, art prompt members was my upstairs neighbor, Melissa, and it's actually her image that was the event image. And we didn't know each other before the pandemic. Mm. And she and her mother, Lisa, who might also be on the Zoom right now, they participated so regularly. And uh, I guess like I hadn't had an experience where I was in collaboration with 350 people daily making work. You know, it felt really like we were in it together, making work together. We had this companionship and and we were also like each other's audience so it was very like we are each other's audience and we are this big group of people doing something together so i think it changed the way i think about collaboration or sharing uh there's, there was there were artists on the list who were sharing too and there were a few things we did that were exchanges like people were drawing each other or People were sending each other boxes of art supplies and uh, we did a sticker exchange. People designed stickers and then I made packages and mailed them out to everybody who participated. So it was like, yeah, it was like you were at a table with a lot of people and you were all doing something together, this feeling of close companionship. So I think the sense of being alone, being a person alone doing art in my room, like I feel like I feel like I feel closer to people now. I feel like, uh, and also this this sort of you know distance between art makers and audiences being so far away. Like I feel like I have different proximities of art making community. You know that it's less it's less about like me and like an a potential audience and more about people and collaboration. And I think that continues and. It's nice, you know, it feels like a different way to interact with making, you know. How interesting that yeah. a period of such extreme isolation would bring you that lesson. And not just yeah. that lesson as something that you would say want in your life, but like that lesson as part of your lived practice. Yeah, it's like it mm. blurred the line for me. It allowed actually more space for me to bring myself more equally. Like instead of thinking I needed to provide something for other people, but like more equally together in something. Hmm. 
I'm thinking of a um, former student of mine who's a, now quite a well-known musician, uh, Jean-Michel Blais, yeah. uh, and he's a pianist and you know his work, he composed it for himself and he played it himself. And over the pandemic, he ended up composing for a little orchestra nice. in this project that's called Obad, which is Dawn. And he said, okay, what is the Dawn for me? Suddenly I'm making music for a whole group of people, yeah. you know, in a period where it wasn't really yet possible to imagine uh, how they were going to practice together and how they were going to make music together. And now he's um, going to be playing at the symphony orchestra in the summer with this whole a group of other musicians. Yeah. And, and nice. actually teaching yourself to be a composer. It's a kind of a, a metaphor for what you're talking about as a collaborator. <laughs> like what if you were somebody who uh, yeah. is imagining not just making music by yourself, but making something that needs to be practiced together in order to be truly full. Yeah, and this this felt like that, you know, like like other people showing up and showing me what they did. And that also informed the other things I thought of doing, you know. Right. So yeah, it definitely felt like I play my part, but everybody else does too, you know, in this kind of did art, you, art orchestra. Art orchestra, <laughs> yeah. Did you know, uh, much about the people who were participating, especially on the like far edges of your acquaintance. Do you know who the oldest person was who who participated or the youngest? Like, do you know who was farthest away? Uh, I do know there were some people in Europe who were doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know the ages of anybody. Huh. I would say probably the youngest was probably two. Right. But I yeah, I don't know the oldest. It's a good yeah. question. I definitely have people in their 60s and 70s uh probably one or two in their 80s but yeah i don't that's just a that's a, just a wild yeah. guess yeah yeah i'm trying to imagine the people in your community can can you imagine having a like a huge party and inviting them all to come oh it'd be say, so good yeah. it would be so amazing to have yeah. a barbecue with all those people but a bunch of them i don't know like a, a a whole whack of them i don't know yeah yeah because people started emailing me and saying like can you sign up these five people so i would say okay right you know <laughs> they're signed up you know so yeah sort of i maybe there were 350 people i probably knew i don't know i i probably knew 200 of them personally or something like that like peripheral yeah but i don't i'd have to look i'd have to look at the yeah that's list. a lot though yeah there was you know uh there were family members there's uh friends and then just just sort of ex expanded yeah, yeah. There's We're, something about it being just on email to you that like you can't you I didn't share anything on social media and I'm quite a social media person, but it was just like it was self contained it was like the self contained system. You know? hmm. We were like our own network of like sharing art just on the email. You know? Yeah, it seems sort of old school. Doing yeah, it, doing it only on email. Yeah, 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 analog. Yeah, yeah a little yeah. analog. Yeah, I suppose a private. Uh, yeah. Were you surprised by the reactions that you got from people? I mean, people were sharing art with you that they let you make public, but I imagine people must have reached out to you more privately as well. Yeah, and uh, you know, also I'll share that at the beginning, a few people joined the list and then said, actually, I'm having so much trouble actually sitting with what's going on. I need you to take me off the list. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so it wasn't for everybody. You know, people had different coping mechanisms that some people did not want to hear about how they're feeling about the pandemic during the pandemic, you know, but uh, yeah, f people, people reached out privately, you know, um, I, I made a, a good friend, I would say her name is Susan Bernstein, she's maybe here, I've never met her, she lives in Brooklyn, and I heard from her almost every day, and she and her partner were in complete isolation because of health, health stuff. And so, yeah, like some real intimate friendships with people I've never met. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So this is an ephemeral project by its nature. Yeah. Um, but do you imagine it having something of an afterlife? Do you imagine trying to make a, a book of images well, and prompts or an exhibition? Well, lots of people have been like, please make a book. And actually, I don't, I, I will ask you, Ariel, like it felt like so much of its own time that I don't even, I don't even know. 
I don't know how, I don't know. Like, yeah. what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people have asked me to do that. The other thing I've said is like, if someone knows of a publisher where it would be a good fit, I'd love to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like, I think with the images would make it more meaningful because uh, I'd want it to be something that existed in a, has its own sort of mm -hmm. container of time, you know, and it does sort of chronicle these different moments. Uh, so it, it might be interesting. It, I guess I'd need to share it with people and see if it felt like it did something in a book form that, you know, like we have, to, I, I'm not sure. But I also like the idea of it just having been an experience. Yeah. So I guess I feel kind of two ways about it. I can imagine an exhibition as well. I guess one of the reasons I can imagine an exhibition is that it's a form that makes sense with a little bit of text and images. Yeah. Rather than a lot of text. And also, yeah. I guess I keep thinking about something where people could physically come together who were part of this project. Yeah, like there are, at the le very least should be. I love that. I, I never thought of that, but I love the idea of a party. That would be yeah, amazing. or a party or yeah. yeah, or a party where you put up a bunch of images or you, yeah. you know, create a kind of an album so that that has some elements of that, too. Yeah, I, I don't know what kind of pandemic art people are going to want after yes. the pandemic. All of these pandemic novels are now starting to come out and um, none of them so far, as far as I know, called the novel coronavirus, which seemed to me like the obvious thing to call your pandemic novel. <laughs> and I keep waiting for somebody to announce it, but maybe it's just too much. Like two weeks in, I thought, who will write the novel coronavirus? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I think that some of these are successful and some of them, I think people just feel fatigued by the experience. You know, there was that conversation at the very beginning about why we don't remember the Spanish flu and why is there no not much yeah. art about the Spanish flu other than that a like Catherine Ann Porter novella <laughs> and a couple of other like editorial cartoons that nobody looks at anymore and actually i think the short mm -hmm. true answer to that is there was a lot about the spanish flu it just hasn't been preserved like it turns out that lots oh. of people or you know there were places there were traces of it that we didn't recognize because they didn't seem meaningful to us. There were small illusions that at wow. the time would have read um, legibly and impactfully. Uh, and it's our historical amnesia, not an absence of discourse uh, that made us lose the Spanish flu from our memory. I feel like we even have that in a small way right now within the history of the pandemic. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's quite hard to remember different moments of what has even happened two years ago you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's i feel like a sort of resistance to connect to it you know, mm -hmm. because there's a desire to have a different relationship to this thing that's still going on but what you're saying is so interesting you know so i was thinking it about your prompts, I was thinking about how time and space operated uh, during the pandemic, and I was thinking about the importance of the window. I thought that was really moving, yeah. this idea of you sending your participants up right up against the window, which was a kind of a, a cordon sanitaire. It was something that was protecting you yeah. from the outside world that was frightening. Yeah, um, but it was also your access to the things outside that could be consolations um, or distractions or companionship. I'm thinking also about all of those signs in the window, the moment of the signs in the window. I think we could break it down. The moment <laughs> totally, of the signs we in the totally window, could. the moment of the rainbows, you know, yeah. and then the, the long night of the curfew. As well. And there were no more rainbows during the curfew. Yeah, well, some, but they looked a little out of place, to be honest. Some of them had stuck around. Uh, Simon Fisher had wrote, wrote that uh, most people who died from the Spanish flu were not those whose records were kept. So, okay, there's been this democratization of recording right now by social media. Yeah, that's absolutely that's true. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm thinking about this memorial project. I don't know if you know it by Rafael Lozano Hemmer. Um, it's a obituary project called um, a crack in the hourglass okay and it was crowdsourced so people sent him uh, photographs of loved ones who had died of COVID during the okay. pandemic and 
you know, I'm sure you remember at the very beginning, there was even this kind of lack of clarity. You know, what were people dying of and what yes. was being said in their obituaries and whose death was counted and yes. was there stigma even attached to death and in ways that I think were reminiscent for those of us who lived through the HIV, yes. uh, the early days of the HIV pandemic. Yes. Um, so what Raphael Lozano Hammer does is he takes these photographs and these testimonials and um, he's made this robot actually to make a portrait out of grains of gray and black and white sand. So it takes about 20 or 30 minutes um, for this robot hand to print out uh, the face of the loved one um, in grains of sand and at the end uh, the palette just tips and like a like a sand mandala like something beautiful and intricate that is made to be destroyed you know it disappears and then those forms of sand uh, they are collected to form the next picture and I thought that was such a wow. incredible project is such an incredible project and it captured so many things for me about yeah. um, mourning during the pandemic the including the technological mediation of mourning, including the fact that for the first time, people weren't showing up to funerals, like funerals were only for family, mourning rituals, you know, were interrupted. Do you think about doing a project on grieving the pandemic or mourning the pandemic? I wanted to, it has been, I have wanted to, and there were a couple of times when I like, there were a couple prompts where I invited people to uh, look in the media and uh, pay an homage to somebody who's like, people weren't quite ready to fully yeah. do it. Um, but I have really wanted to. And I find that work that you just described extremely moving. You know, yeah, it captures so many things. Yeah, and I, it feels like there's a lack of, like there was that one New York Times, I think that published Many, yes. many, many, I can't remember how many, but thousands of people's obituaries on the same yeah. day or something. Uh, I, I have a, a longing to be involved in some kind of something like yeah. that. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're at the beginning of memorialization projects, um, yeah. even as we are in a moment of like ongoing loss. So uh, there's the hearts on the bridge in, um, on the wall in London. All of the red hearts yeah. uh, there were white flag projects on the lawn of dc and um Don't washington to look them up. Yeah. yeah yeah anyway i'll send you a bunch of those yeah projects. yeah because like you know in quebec over four hundred thousand people have passed so far you know that we've counted no yeah not four hundred thousand. no 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 five five thousand five a little 5200 in montreal and uh 40 40,000 yeah. yes sorry yeah i mean <laughs> yes <laughs> they, these staggering numbers are so incomprehensible hard to numbers not 400 oh 000. wow um maybe i'll open this up to questions because we yeah. actually, actually have some uh comments in the yeah uh so people can raise their hand or just unmute i don't know mark uh do you want to just say some of the things that you've been writing or shall i read them out what do you think Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And, you know, I'm I'm on a kind of low bandwidth situation here, so <laughs> my screen is freezing a lot. I apologize. Okay. No, it's completely fine. So, what Mark? One of the things that Mark Sussman, um, who uh, directs a CISC, which is uh, the sponsor of the Healthy Humanities and the Arts Working Group, um, one of the things that he was saying in the comments is that. Uh, intergenerational all the time and get serious about making a mess yes <laughs> yeah okay so less frightened than i am about mess making i suppose as a like as a puppeteer you probably have to be um, and he wrote i appreciate the discussion about the amnesia that set in uh, responding to the great capitalist economic pressure to forget normalize and move on and he gave us a link to a project called uh, naming the lost working on assisting communities in creating memorial spaces to grieve those lost during the pandemic and uh, lots of community groups are involved in participating so simone lucas uh, also wrote uh, she knows a bunch of people who are involved in the naming the lost project public do-it-yourself uh, community memorials so 
what's nice about that model is that it's not kind of a like a top down yeah. or something that's sort of infrastructure heavy you know and solemn like a like a cenotaph or a statue it sounds like it is a really um, decentralized model for commemorating loss like rather than let's say a, a centralized square um, somebody was asking if anybody knows of a canada or ontario based covid memorial um, I don't know of anything that is large scale, but I know that there is a old age home here in Montreal. Is this sounding familiar to anybody? Where they're establishing a memorial project that is going to involve in part, it's one of the places where a lot of people were lost at the very beginning of the pandemic, because as we know in Quebec, especially like the huge toll at the beginning, uh, yes. the, like the shame, the shame of the Quebec pandemic, maybe the, maybe the first shame, maybe even the greatest shame of the Quebec pandemic was yeah. um, the abandonment of the elderly. So uh, I think there are plans for a memorial walk actually, oh. and garden and benches in the garden um, around this old age home that was, a, that was a space that had experienced so much loss. I don't know if anybody else knows of other memorial projects, um, but please feel free to jump in if you do, uh, or, if you have any other thoughts or questions or responses. I have been keeping picturing the AIDS, the AIDS quilt. Yeah. Just now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, there's also actually an incredible Instagram memorial huh. for those lost from AIDS. So moving. Um, yeah, and really powerful. And I think there is a COVID quilt as well. I'm just trying to track. Oh, I'm yes, to track there the was room. a COVID quilt. Yeah. yeah, I think so. That might have been started in Canada. Uh, but I, yeah, I that's right. So anyone, anyone here who is part of this project? Anybody who, okay, as Susan's giving us the, the griefdeck.com. Anybody who uh, participated in it all the way through? I have to confess, I was one of the bad students. No, there are no bad students. <laughs> I was, yeah. I started <laughs> off and then I think it, um, it made me feel too guilty to not do my homework. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think I can, I, I can manage that on top of the other things that are requirements. Um, Jane, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like being a participant? I suppose I could. Great. Um, <laughs> just to say, um, being Sarah's mother was <laughs> really <laughs> exciting to participate every day. It, it uh, helped me stay connected to her, which was beautiful. But um, beyond that, it, it was um, lovely to uh, have a project to go to every day. And I don't think I did it every day, but, but most days. I did read it every day. And so, uh, it, yeah. It, it um, it was a lifeline, I would say. It's lovely. And now I look around the house, and there's there are a few things here that that happened as projects um, from Sarah's art prompts. So, yeah, it was lovely to participate. Um, Shannon Lee in the comments is saying that these memorials have to be sent uh, daily to provincial governments making decisions to get rid of protections. Okay, so what? What role does memory have right now as a kind of a prophylactic, uh, or is it even possible for memory to act as a prophylactic? Uh, what what kind mean, of reminders like, will slow us down yeah, on the march to normal? I mean, like I was reading uh, the Gazette a few days ago and they said, you know, there's no way to know now how many uh, cases we have, you know, uh, and that's because our PCR testing sites have been closed down, you know, but it's weird because like we remember when we could get tested, you know, that was a few months ago, yeah. you know, so it's interesting this sort of like political shift towards trying to push us in these other directions when we can remember when there were already other circumstances. So it's like uh, pretty interesting how like 
it it does feel like like confrontational sometimes to be like well i remember last week mm. <laughs> i remember last week right. when we could get a pcr test i remember last week when parents were emailed when there was a case in their kids class you know i i i remember last week when somebody like when they had covid could stay home for 10 days you know to make sure that they were okay and, and they weren't worried about um other people catching it you know so it's i don't know if that's art but it feels like memory in a lot of ways is like resistance at the moment mm -hmm. you know like i remember uh, you know at the beginning where other accommodations were made you know or i remember serb you know mm -hmm. uh so i feel like memory and documenting in a variety of ways is resistance and is opposition to um, any sorts of things that are trying to manipulate situations and present a different truth because we've had all these other truths that just happened, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes I feel like Legault, like when he's he's organizing his openings and unveilings around Christian holidays, like 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 he's trying to construct a sort of COVID narrative within a Christian calendar, you know, so that he can be like the Easter Bunny and then Santa Claus with these different uh, changes in restrictions and stuff, you know. Um, it's very helpful for people to just show what's happening, mm. you know, like just reveal what's going on, like internally and externally in opposition to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, do you want to speak or do you want me to read out what you're saying or um, shall we leave it in the chat here? You can chime in if you want. Uh, Shannon had suggested that these memorials need to be uh, reminders for government and that it's frustrating that uh, the decisions that are being made politically are perhaps prolonging the pandemic. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about your work as a little bit of a, a time capsule too. And I'm wondering all the way through, I mean, there are these political implications. How consciously was this a political project? Did you feel like sometimes you had prompts that were uh, political prompts? Um, how did you understand politics in relation to this? And were there moments where you thought, okay, this is, I don't want this to be politicized in alienating ways. So here are some choices that I'm not going to make. Yeah, well, I like so I was a daycare worker until the pandemic, and then I decided not to return. So I I was in a moment of like privilege with the ability to say no in a certain way. And uh, I said no, because it just really felt uncertain. And it really felt like there wasn't knowledge about how that work could be done safely and it wasn't prioritized at all. And so I felt like I was in this situation where I was relating to the government in this way, in this way that was more extreme than I'd ever experienced before, where I was like noticing like thoughts about what our labor was, what our labor did. Like we were supposed to at a certain point be daycare workers for essential service kids, which, you know, in theory is a great idea, but none of these children know each other. Daycare work is very relational. It was just like, I'm just not sure they're understanding, like, what would we actually be doing, you mm. know, with children who don't know each other and that we don't know, you know. And so, um, so I felt really like, sort of engaged in that kind of political thing at the moment. And I also felt very aware that like, I could choose not to go to that job and nobody else in my workplace had the same circumstances and most daycare workers are women of color, you know, like this, the situation is is like very clear and um, pretty extreme. Um, and then we had, you know, these this political uprising around like violence against black people and we have, you know, uh, like all these different moments where I was like, okay, let's bring people like it felt like I really needed to like acknowledge and bring people into certain relationships to action, you know. Um, and so I just felt like, you know, I felt comfortable being honest and just like inviting certain invitations. Um, I'm not like that interested in really saying much otherwise about what I think. So like 
like I offer an invitation and it has a certain goal, like there was one prompt that was like, can we imagine uh, our communities without police? Like, what would that look like? You know, like what would community care look like in another way? You know, mm -hmm. so that's like, that's a defund the police stance. You know, do I need everyone to agree with me? No. Do I know what that would look like? Really? No. You know, so it's like, I tried to be like, fine with us all not knowing something, but I tried to ask mm -hmm. certain questions that were like, you know, pretty clear in where I stood, mm -hmm. but um, I never, if anybody ever sent me something, I never criticized what they said, you know, so people, I just sort of like people represent themselves as they do. Mm -hmm. And that's totally fine. You know, mm -hmm. like, let us, let us all speak for ourselves. So mm -hmm. I'll speak for myself and you speak for yourself. And that's, that's it. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems so essential with this kind of project. I'm thinking of the power of the phrase, I remember that things can be otherwise. Yeah, I remember that things were otherwise. I remember that things can be otherwise. And one of the strange effects of this pandemic was that uh, we had this crash course in in otherwise in um, in working from home in having a universal basic income, which is basically what yeah. what CERB was until yeah. it went away. And there, there's a way in which moving on seems to involve in part forgetting that things can be otherwise. No. I think there are a lot of negative lessons from the pandemic. Like I think there were a lot of, yeah. uh, so much of the experience was so hard for so many people. Um, and yet there were moments of otherwise that felt almost counterfactual and felt powerful. And I'm curious about how you think we might retain that imagination of otherwise, time can be otherwise, space can be otherwise, our, our responsibility to other people's health can be otherwise, our relationship to government can be otherwise. I love that. I, I long for that. I, and I think I have experienced that in the pandemic. So it feels more hopeful and it feels more possible. I feel like many of our relationships to money has changed. Like, it's maybe a small thing, but like having so many different economic circumstances and realizing that like you can change spending and you can change relative cost of living and you can like choose to support different things. It just felt like there's like some choice stuff there that like makes more things possible for myself personally. Maybe this is useful. Like you know, I was in school before and in school part time and working 25 hours a week, and I never thought it was possible to give myself enough time for my studies. And now I see it is possible to give myself expansive time so that I actually have time to think about new ideas and get inspired and seek out new opportunities. And I don't think like I really don't think I thought that was possible before. Like mm -hmm. I think I thought I have a limited amount of energy and time for this and this is all I will permit myself because it's all that I can imagine. You know, I think it's a relationship to imagining. And so like I think we can apply that to many different things, you know, where we can sort of say like I'm curious about this and I and I think it could be otherwise. You know, like mm -hmm. I think it could be different than it is you know even this thing where like we are people now you know if you're maybe going to see a friend and then they have a small cold and they say let's just be careful i'll see you in a week you know the adaptability to be like uh whatever you're comfortable with you want to come remotely you want you know like a less of an attachment to form and time also yeah like we have to delay this 10 days and that's doable, you know, we need to shut things down, it's doable, you know, so in many, many ways, things are not just uh, what's the what's the, the sh they're, it's really just not the show must go on in many interpersonal ways. You know? mm -hmm. Right, there's been so, all, all kinds of um, flexibility and some of it's been incredibly stressful <laughs> and very, very, very difficult to manage. What uh, I would like to to be able to make more space for in time is like, I want to hear from 
nurses like a lot like i want to hear for, from nurses for days like mm. about what they what kind of care they can imagine if like providing ways they could reimagine their work lives like i just feel like there's so much knowledge and care and and love people bring to their work and burnout and exhaustion and you know like everything together and i just i just want to hear a live stream of nurses for like you know 60 days straight tamira kahana is uh volunteering tamira <laughs> uh, tamira do you want to join in or do you want to leave that for something that you will explore with sarah okay. later on <laughs> anyway thank you so much for your contribution um, I think of you as somebody who's actually a master of the imagination, Sarah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, we'll have to organize a, a nurse talk, Tamira, another time. I think that's a really fantastic idea and um, much needed. Does anybody have any final questions or anything else to say before we wrap up? Um, thank you, Sarah. I think it's been your work over the last two years has been so generous and that is um, so typical of the way that you exist in the world. I've known you for a long time, so um, it's not a surprise to me, but it's really extraordinary to see it reach so many different people. I, I guess as a last question, what do you think's next for you? What do you think you're going to be working on next? Or what can you imagine doing next? Uh, well, um, I'm really I'm really just excited. I mean, it's strange, but I'm really excited about learning math. Like I, I feel like I feel like letting myself be expansive means letting myself be excited about new things. And I'm excited about bringing my new my new uh, love of learning and facing my fear around learning math and science into my art practice. And I just feel like I feel like like I want to do like large scale interactive learning uh, research things in like a gallery setting or in a, in a community setting. So it's a little bit different than this, but honestly, it doesn't feel to me in my heart different than this. Well, because it's something that is uh, nourishing and creative and communal, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although I don't think you're going to get me excited about math, but I, I saw I, your body. Your body. I challenge really... you to try. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I I so appreciate this chance to like revisit this project. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just very grateful for this experience. Oh, it's uh, it was such a terrific project. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, do you want to see us out? You are here I, and I, you're gone. <laughs> it's because I, I have to be in two places at once to switch your cameras. So oh, here I am. Hi. Um, yeah, just thank you so much for this conversation and for this moment that you've created for us to reflect on a this project and just kind of what we've been collectively living uh, and how. And I, I really appreciate uh, all the ideas that people were sharing in the chat as well. We'll make sure to save that for you. Um, Sarah and Ariella, so you can revisit it at a later time. Okay, my MacBook is telling me I'm about to run out of power. That means I guess it's shut off time. It's been a great and wonderful conversation. Thanks you, thank you all for joining us, and uh, great to have you in the space, Sarah and uh, Ariella. We appreciate you so much. Thank Until you. next time, everybody, have a great evening. Ciao. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. All right.